continue in our sermon series titled Pentecostal People, and we have been talking about what it means to be Pentecostal people. The first week we said that Pentecostal people are Christ-centered. Do you guys remember that? We are, everybody say it with me, Christ-centered. Second, we believe that we're Bible-based. Everybody say it with me. We are Bible-based. And lastly, because we are Pentecostal people, we are Spirit-empowered. Say it with me, Spirit-empowered. Now, let's just say those six words together today. We are Christ-centered, Bible-based, Spirit-empowered. If someone asks you what Livestream Church is like, you can give them our mission statement, and you can say, we are people helping people find and follow Jesus. That's our mission. But if you want to describe what we're like and how we worship and what we expect from God, what God's doing in our midst, we are Christ-centered people who are Bible-based, and we are Spirit-empowered. And let me tell you something. We can claim to be Spirit-empowered, but if we don't wait on God and think about what we really believe and develop our faith to receive more from God, we'll say we're spirit-empowered, but really, we're human-powered. I don't want to be human-powered. I want to be spirit-empowered. Listen, the stuff that God's doing at Livestream Church is not because the pastor is so talented. It's not because the staff are so intelligent. It's not because we have money in the bank. It's not because of the location of our building. All those things are great blessings, and I'm thankful for those nice things. But if anything gets accomplished at Livestream Church, it is by his spirit and not our might and our energy and our strength or talent. Amen? And so we want to continually be people who are spirit-empowered, spirit-empowered. Years ago, I'm going to start with a quick story. Years ago, I had a friend who call, whose wife called me in the middle of the night. I'd known this guy since we were young. And his wife called me in the middle of the night, and he was having a terrible time. So my wife and I got in our car, and at like midnight, we drove to his house because there was something really wrong. Turns out he was filled with anxiety, and he was having a panic attack. And he was going through a host of things in his young life that were just somewhat difficult and causing him to, to have this panic attack and to have great anxiety. He was a smart guy. Uh, he had a college degree. He was in his first job making a great income with uh, benefits and, and, and promised retirement and, and good things like this. Uh, he had a loving wife, talented, smart, beautiful lady, and they had their first baby. It was about a one year old at the time. And just everything was going wonderfully for him in life, but yet he was just filled with worry and anxiety at this particular time. Uh, and, and there were a few things that just weren't being accomplished in his life that he felt like God had called him to. And so we prayed together. And, you know, sometimes when somebody's having a, a real panic attack, all you can do is just ride it out with them. Have you ever been there? Just ride it out with them. Just be there. Just be their friend and, and just ride the thing out. Because it's physiological and it's emotional as well as maybe circumstantial. Sometimes there's no circumstances and it's just physiological. Sometimes you just ride it out with them. So we did that. We prayed together. We talked about encouraging things. Um, and finally, uh, in the middle of the night, early, early in the morning, uh, we finally left. But before I left, I thought, let's, let's give some hope for tomorrow. I said, let's go out to lunch. And he said, yes, let's do that. So he went to work in the morning. And when his lunch break hit, uh, we met at my office and uh, we we're going to go out for lunch. And the Holy Spirit prompted me just before we were getting ready to go to lunch to ask him a question. I'd known him since he was saved. I remember when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I remember in college when the Lord spoke to his heart and told him what he was going to do with the rest of his life. So I'd known this guy for a while. And he came into my office. I said, I think the Holy Spirit wants me to ask you a question. I said, I remember when you're saved. I remember when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I remember when God gave you a call for your life and told you what you're going to do with the rest of your life. When's the last time you spoke in tongues? He said, I can't even remember the last time I spoke in tongues. I think you need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. I think you need, a, you need to be refilled and you need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit in your life. Can we just pray right now before we go to lunch? He said, yeah. He lifted up his hands and, and not tears of panic, not tears of anxiety, but tears of joy began to roll down his cheeks. And I knew they were tears of joy because he chuckled twice. He laughed twice and then began speaking in tongues. He knew what it was to be full of the Holy Spirit, but he hadn't received a fresh touch. He hadn't waited on God. He hadn't sought the Lord for a, an empowerment from the Holy Spirit in his life for a long, long time. And he'd been living on his intelligence. He'd been living on his energy, been living on his own abilities. And listen, he needed the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for what was next in his life. Amen. 
I'm telling you what, that was, that was the beginning of overcoming a real battle in his life. And part of overcoming that battle, part of overcoming that battle for him was receiving empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you something today, church? Listen to me, every single person in this room. You need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And what you received in the past was good for the past, but you need a touch from God today. You need a touch from the Holy Spirit today for this week. You need a touch from the Holy Spirit for this time in your life, not the old time in your life that you've already lived. What you received when you were at kids camp and what you received when you were at youth camp, what you received when you were in that college ministry, that was good for that day is what you needed in that day. But God wants to give you a fresh touch of his Holy Spirit today for this week, for the things you're facing now. Some of you, you received a touch from God when you were at kids camp, but listen, now you're a high schooler and you need a fresh touch from God for this new year of high school. Some of you are going to college and you receive a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit back when you went to youth camp, but you need a fresh touch from God when you're going to college this year year and the pressures that you're going to face when you get there. Some of you, you need a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit for the things that you're facing with a new family or a new job or a new career. God wants to empower you by his Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you about being spirit empowered today. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in spirit empowerment. So what are some key beliefs that make a person Pentecostal? I've already told you, being Pentecostal doesn't have to do with the style of worship that you sing. It doesn't have to do with the shape of your building or the color of your carpet. It doesn't have anything to do with the clothes that people wear when they come to church. Are you wearing like long jeans with hair in a bun and kids? Or are you wearing blue jeans and a shirt untucked like Pastor Paul? It's not about the clothes that you wear. It's about some things that you believe and some, some things that you believe that affect the way that you practice your Christianity. Is everybody with me today? Let me tell you some things that Pentecostals believe. Number one, we believe that the Holy Spirit is active tangibly today. Everybody say tangibly. Tangibly. That means you can can feel, touch, and know what the Holy Spirit is doing. When I was a, a freshman in high school, someone invited me to my first church event in a Pentecostal church. And I sat somewhere in like the third row over here on a Wednesday night. I was the only teenager in the room because I didn't know there was such a thing as youth group. I'd never heard of it. And so all the youth were at youth group on Wednesday night, and I went to church with all the adults. And I'm sitting in that service, and as they began to sing a couple songs, I didn't know the songs. I'd never heard them before. They weren't familiar to me at all. But as they began to sing those songs, just a wave of heat hit my body. And I was like, what in the world is that? I've been to the Lutheran church. I've been to the Catholic church. I've been to the Presbyterian church. I've been to the Methodist church. I've been to this. What was that? And I looked at my mother, who was sitting next to me, and I said, Mom, did you feel what just went through this room? Something, is, something just happened right there. She leaned over, and she goes, I think that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I was like, really? That, like, the Holy Spirit can be felt? Never, I never thought that was a possibility up until that point in my life. I want you to know that we believe the Holy Spirit is working, and sometimes we feel him, we sense him, we see him in some tangible ways. Everybody say tangible. Number two, we believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit is for believers today. It's not something that is just relegated to the past. It's for believers today. We believe that the initial, not the only evidence, but the initial evidence of someone being baptized in the Holy Spirit is that they speak in tongues. We believe that tongues should have never disappeared from the church. We believe that tongues should have never disappeared from the, let me rephrase this, from the majority of the church because it didn't disappear completely. Can I tell you a couple quick stories that are kind of funny to just say that tongues didn't disappear completely? There's a whole bunch of other stories I could tell you, but let me just pick two that I think are pertinent for this morning. One is about St. Patrick. Anybody ever heard of St. Patrick? He has a holiday. Did you know that? So here's the the real story of St. Patrick. Everybody, you know, wants to make St. Most people celebrate him as like playing the flute and like leading mice out of something. Who was that? That's the Pied Piper. Okay, good. I'm getting these guys mixed up. Anyway, there's all these weird things about St. Patrick. I think St. Patrick would be disgusted with the holiday that people celebrate and put his name on. Because here's the deal. Let me tell you about the real St. Patrick. He was born in Wales, but around 700, 725 AD, he was captured and taken as a slave to Ireland. And for his young years, growing up as a young man and as a teenager, he was a slave in Ireland. Somewhere in his early 20s, he was able to escape slavery, and he found passage back to Wales. 
as a young adult. When he got back to Wales as a young adult, probably in his 20s or early 30s, he chose Christianity and he became a believer. Praise God. He became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he felt God was calling him to go back to the place where he was a slave and tell them about Jesus because they were all pagans and they worshiped like nature and things like this. And so he traveled back to Ireland as a missionary and he planted hundreds of churches and won thousands of people to Jesus Christ. And that's why he's called St. Patrick. And that's why there's a holiday named after him. Because he was a powerful missionary that did powerful work for God on the island of Ireland, just west of England. Guys, that's the story of St. Patrick. Now listen, one of my doctoral professors loves Celtic history, and she has read St. Patrick's Diary. And in St. Patrick's diary, he mentions this one instance where he's praying and he began speaking in a language he'd never heard before and he didn't know what to do with it, but he knew it was the presence of God. Can I tell you that speaking in tongues may have disappeared from the majority of the church, but it didn't disappear completely from the church and it should have never disappeared. Is everybody with me today? Let me give you another story. Um, there's a guy named Stanley Horton who was... Uh, a uh, Pentecostal, spirit-filled, charismatic um, uh, theologian. And he is probably the foremost theologian of Pentecostal studies in all of the 20th century. His mother, back in 1906, living in Los Angeles in the Cal Southern California area, went to the Azusa Street Revival on Azusa Street in the little livery stable where thousands and thousands of people were being baptized in the Holy Spirit in the three-year-long revival that literally took place in a horse stable. It blew up and went all over the world. Well, his mother uh, went to the Azusa Street Revival, and uh, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And so she called her mother or contacted her mother, who had been a Christian minister's wife all of her life, and said, Mom, I know you love Jesus, but you need to come check this out. You need to see what God is doing in this place. And so her mom, Stanley Horton's grandmother, went to the Azusa Street Revival with her daughter, and she saw people being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And she said to her daughter, she said, I've been praying like this since the 1880s, and no one ever explained what it is. Baptist pastor's wife. You wonder why God used Stanley Horton in such a powerful way. Anybody here grow up Assemblies of God? Anybody been AG for like a few decades? Listen, if you grew up in the AG, if you've been AG for a while, Hershey or, or Rennell, you probably went to Sunday school back in the 80s. All of the adult curriculum was written by that man that was in your, for your Sunday school classes. Listen, God used that man mightily. And in part, God used him mightily because he was full of the Holy Spirit he had a mom who was full of the Holy Spirit, and he had, a, he had a Baptist grandma who was baptized in the Holy Spirit and didn't even know what it was back in the 1880s before the Azusa Street Revival. Listen, guys, we believe that this move of the Holy Spirit, this experience with the Holy Spirit that the Bible described is something that should be going on in the church regularly. Not some unusual thing, not some strange thing, not something that only happens in revivals. It's something that we should all be experiencing regularly an empowerment from the Holy Spirit so that we have his power for living. Number five, here's the last thing we believe. We believe that speaking in tongues is a spiritually edifying discipline for an individual. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, when a person speaks in tongues, they edify themselves. So when I'm praying in the Spirit or speaking in tongues, and I'm, even when I'm all by myself and I'm alone and I'm praying and, and I'm praying in the Spirit or speaking in tongues, worshiping the Lord, and I begin to speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit is strengthening me and I'm being edified on the inside. The Holy Spirit is helping me to pray in ways that go beyond anything I could do in my own mind. Now listen carefully. I've talked to you about some things we believe. Let me tell you what God is doing in the world today. Is everybody with me today? Listen real carefully. You're going to have to think hard to catch all this. There are over 8 billion people on earth. That's a lot of people, right? 8 billion people on earth. The Center for Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, which is not Pentecostal, but it is a good Christian school. Listen to this. Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary says that there were 2.5 billion Christians on the planet in 2019. 
That's up from 2.3 billion, according to the Pew Research Center in 2015. So aren't you glad that there are more Christians in the world than there were before? So Christianity is growing. There is an increase in number of people who love Jesus or serve Jesus or claim to be a Christian. So about 31% of the world's population considers themselves to be Christians. Like if you survey them, they would say, I'm a Christian. That's 31% of the world's population. Just about half of all Christians came, claim to be Catholic. So 1.2 billion Christians are, are not Roman Catholic, and about 1.3 billion Christians on the earth are Roman Catholic. Of the 1.2 billion Christians who are not Roman Catholic, 583 million claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. Today, 583 million claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic, so about 26.8% of all global Christians claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. And catch this, that is a claim that did not exist 123 years ago. It wasn't even a category in Christianity because this belief in the tangible experience of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, the baptism and fullness of the Holy Spirit, had disappeared from the majority of Christianity. Is everybody with me today? It wasn't even a category. And now a quarter, a quarter of all Christians claim that they're Pentecostal or charismatic. So how many of you know someone who has Pentecostal practice, but they don't go to a Pentecostal or charismatic church. Like you know someone that's Roman Catholic and they're full of the Holy Spirit and they pray in the Spirit. They speak in tongues, they believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Or maybe you know someone that's, um, that's uh, at a, a, a Presbyterian or Methodist, another type of uh, maybe evangelical Christian church that preaches Jesus but doesn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues, but yet there are people in those churches that do believe it and they do practice it. How many of you know somebody like that? gobs of us know people like that. And so here's what I would suggest to you today. Based on that kind of information, that kind of evidence, and more research, I believe that it's possible today that across all types of Christians, people who practice the Pentecostal distinctions of being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, make up 40, 40 to 50 percent of all Christianity on the planet, regardless of denomination. 40 to 50 percent. Believe what we believe. This is for today. It's for us. God wants to empower his people through the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, listen to this. The, this is the Pew Research Center saying this. They're not Christians. You with me? It's a secular organization that does research all around the world. Who's heard of the Pew Research Center? Okay, you've heard of them? Listen to this. They said that today, 23% of Americans claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. Sometimes we get real down on the numbers, like when we hear the statistics. America used to be 90% Christian, and then it was 75% Christian, and now it's down to 60% Christian. People are turning away from Jesus, and, and not everybody's serving the Lord anymore. But can I tell you something? A category that didn't exist 120 years ago, 23% of America claims to be Pentecostal or charismatic. Do you realize that we're making an effect in the world? God is, and, and it's not just us, give God the glory. God is doing something on the earth, church. Can you hear me? God is doing something on earth. That's America. 23% of America is Pentecostal charismatic. Listen to this. 30% of Chileans claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. 44% of Filipinos today claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. 49% of the entire population of Brazil claims to be Pentecostal or charismatic. There were 22 million evangelicals in Brazil, and 12 million of them are Pentecostals. There's 3 million in America. There's 12 million in Brazil. Listen to this. 56% of Kenyans today claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic, and 60% of Guatemalans claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic. God is doing something on the earth. And I want to be a part of what God is doing on the earth. I want to be a part of the ways that God is building the kingdom on the planet. I want to be a part of the move of God that is continuing in the thread and the stream of the Reformation that's been going on for 500 years, where the church is reforming and being renewed and receiving from God all the things that he has for us. 
so that we would be renewed, empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish something amazing and essential and global in these last days before Jesus comes again. And I believe that we get to be a part of that. Praise God, we get to be a part of that. Amen? What I'm saying today, I'm saying that when we preach the full gospel, that Jesus saves, Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit, Jesus heals, and Jesus is coming again. When we preach the full gospel, people want all that God has for them. People are hungry for more of God. People want to experience the reality of the Holy Spirit, the reality of God's power, the reality of God's strength in their life. And we need the reality of God's strength and spirit and power in our lives because we live in a difficult time. We can't just be cultural Christians anymore. There are too many forces coming against the church today for us to sit back and be lazy and lethargic in our faith. We've got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to stay faithful, to be a godly witness, to to stand up for Jesus in a world where many people are fighting against him. We need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen today. Amen. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I'm not asking you to, to believe in this doctrine just because you're jumping on the bandwagon. Well, there's a billion people or there's millions of people that are Pentecostal now. Let's do it because lots of people are doing it. No, we're Bible-based. And I want to give you an argument from the Scripture as to why so many people are hungry for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because it's in the Bible. And what I want to show you today is that Jesus discipled his disciples to receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the Holy Spirit. Jesus discipled his disciples to receive that. And then his disciples discipled others the exact same way. And if that's how Jesus discipled his disciples, and if that's how his disciples discipled the early church, that's how we should be discipled too. Amen? Yeah. And we're going to see that in the Bible today. So what I want to suggest to you today is that you need to live a Spirit-empowered life because Jesus taught his disciples to live a Holy Spirit-empowered life. Amen? I want to live a Spirit-empowered life because Jesus taught his disciples to live a Holy Spirit-empowered life, and those disciples taught their disciples likewise. There was an expectation. And I'm going to say this at the, at the beginning. What you believe determines what you receive. What you believe determines what you receive. Is everybody with me today? If you don't believe that Holy Spirit empowerment is for you, then you won't get it. If you don't believe healing is for you, then you won't get it. If you don't believe life transformation is for you, then you won't be transformed. You'll keep living in your sin and you'll struggle with that thing on and on and on. Listen, we've got to have faith. I've got to have faith that God has something for me and I'm going to receive it. It's going to change me. It's going to transform me. And I'm going to live a new way because of what he has for me. Is everybody with me today? What you believe determines what you receive. Listen to this. Your expectation determines your destination. What you expect from God will determine where you're going with God. And I want to give you some Bible today to help you change your expectation and expect empowerment from the Holy Spirit by looking at how the disciples were discipled. Is everybody ready today? Let's look how Jesus discipled the disciples. So the disciples of Jesus experienced the Holy Spirit the day that they were saved. We believe that when a person is saved, there's an experience with the Holy Spirit that they have at that moment of salvation. Amen? What happened? John chapter 20, verse 22. Read it out loud with me. We're going to put it on the screen. Read this out loud with me today. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. He has just appeared gloriously in a locked room. And let's get that scripture slide on the screen, and let's read it together. Jesus spoke to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, so send I you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What happened in that moment? Listen, the disciples of Jesus knew that he was Lord. Remember what Peter said even before Jesus went to the cross? Thou art the Christ the son of the living God. They believed Jesus was Lord. They believed that he died on the cross 
for their sins to be forgiven. And amazingly, God worked it all out that he died on the cross for their sins to be forgiven at Passover. These Jewish guys got the picture. He died for our sins. He is the atoning sacrifice for us to be cleansed. And now they've heard from the ladies that morning that the tomb is empty. What is going on? And then he appears in their midst and they can touch him. He's standing there with them. He ate with them. He's alive. He is Lord. He died on a cross for my sins to be forgiven. He's risen from the grave. That's New Testament Christianity, isn't it? What did Paul say about this in Romans chapter 10? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10. Verse 9 and 10. What did these people believe? They believe Jesus is Lord. They believe he died on the cross for their sins to be forgiven. They believe he rose from the grave. And so what did he give them? He gave them the Holy Spirit. When you choose Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. We call that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. Everybody say indwelling. That's the Holy Spirit living in a believer. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You are set free from sin, and now you are led by the Spirit. Those that are led by the Spirit are sons of God, Romans 8. The Spirit confirms to your spirit that you're God's child. His Spirit testifies with our spirit that we really are God's children, Romans chapter 8. The Spirit convicts us of sin. Jesus said that the Spirit would convict us of sin and convince us of righteousness. And how many of you are glad that the Holy Spirit living in you still convicts you of sin? God changed a whole lot about me in the moment that I got saved, but he didn't change everything about me the moment that I got saved. He's been working on me. And even though I've been saved for uh, 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 decades, <laughs> a while, he's still working on me. Amen? And sometimes he's shown me some things that I'm wrong about, that I've thought wrong for a long time. And sometimes he uses a person to speak to me. Sometimes he uses his word to speak to me. Sometimes just his Holy Spirit drops a thought in my mind and I realize that it's God and I realize it's scripture and I realize it's right and I know it's the Holy Spirit. And I feel that conviction and I'm convicted of that, but then I'm convinced of what is right and I change and I do my life different. I'm still in that process. Aren't you glad that there's still the conviction of the Holy Spirit happening in our lives today? Somebody say amen. The Spirit guides you into increasing holiness, and the Holy Spirit also guides you in service and in ministry. He shows you your giftings. He shows you some passions. He shows you some things that you should be doing for Jesus to be glorified through your life. The Holy Spirit guides us all in ministry, and the Holy Spirit in you produces changes in your life that the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. When your life is transformed and when you're changed and you start living more like Jesus, you will have the fruit of the Spirit. It's described in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. And everybody, every believer with the Holy Spirit living inside of them experiences these things. That's a lot to experience with the Holy Spirit, isn't it? How many of you are glad that as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you? Come on. Are you glad that the Holy Spirit lives in you? What a privilege. What a joy. To have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me. So that's what happened on the day of resurrection. But then Jesus instructed the disciples to expect more. The disciples were instructed by Jesus to expect more. Read this passage of scripture with me. We're going to put it on the screen. Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus is speaking to the disciples after he had risen from the grave. And let's read it together. Jesus said, I am going to send you what my father promised. Read it out loud. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now, let's read another word of Jesus. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Another instruction from Jesus to his disciples, to his followers. He said this in Acts 1 8. He said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons and exactly when God's going to do everything in the future. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Now, when Jesus rose from the grave, he told the disciples to go to Galilee. He met them in Galilee. There was a miraculous catch of fish, and he reinstituted Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Do you really love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you really love me? More than these. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And now I'm embarrassed. That little story about Peter, that happened at the Sea of Galilee. But then Jesus sent them back to Jerusalem. And they're good Jewish people, and so they would go back to Jerusalem because... 50 days after Passover is the Jewish feast of Pentecost, and all the Jews are supposed to meet at the temple and worship God and celebrate harvest and celebrate some things that took place at Pentecost. And so the feast of Pentecost is coming up, and Jesus sends them back to Jerusalem, and they're back to Jerusalem sometime before Jesus ascends to heaven. Remember, Jesus rose from the grave. He went up to Galilee and met with the disciples. They came back to Jerusalem, and when Jesus ascended to heaven, he ascended from the Mount of Olives. Here's Jerusalem on a hill in mid-middle Judea. And there's a deep valley called the Kidron Valley. On the other side of the valley is the Mount of Olives. If you stand on the Mount of Olives, you look down, and there's the Garden of Gethsemane. And right across the valley, you are looking at the old temple wall. That's where Jesus ascended to heaven. So where were they when Jesus ascended to heaven? They were in Jerusalem. What did they do after Jesus ascended into heaven? For 10 days, they stayed in the city. Why? Because he said... Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And they're like, well, it's going to happen in Jerusalem because this is where Jesus told us to stay. And so they stayed there for 10 more days praying and seeking the Lord. So listen, I want you to catch some imagery here that the disciples caught. And I believe the Apostle Paul caught. Watch this. Jesus was crucified at the Passover celebration. What is the celebration of Passover? It's an Old Testament celebration. God set it up about 1,450 years before Jesus was born. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And God said, I'm going to set you all free, but all the firstborn of Egypt are going to die. Your firstborn don't have to die. Take a lamb, kill it, and take the blood of that lamb and paint it on the doorposts or the door frames of your house. And when my angel that's going to go through the land and kill all the firstborn sees that blood, he will pass over your house. That's the Old Testament story of Passover. And every year they celebrate Passover. Well, then what happened next? The Jewish people, they, they escape out of Egypt in the middle of the night. They cross the Red Sea miraculously, and the Egyptian army is drowned. Remember the story. Some of, if you're new to the Bible, just know this is in the book of Exodus where we find this story. And they escape across the desert until they come to Mount Sinai. Along the way, they ran out of water, and God miraculously gave them water from a rock at Rephidim. And God started to give them manna along the way because there was no food for them to eat. And there was nowhere there for them to grow food in the desert. And they're traveling too fast to wait for a harvest. And they arrive at Sinai. God said to them at Sinai, consecrate yourselves to the Lord because the Lord is going to come down on the mountain and he's going to meet with you. And so they consecrated themselves. Listen to this. 50 days after Passover, God came down on the mountain. And the mountain was covered with smoke, and it was covered with fire, and the mountain shook with an earthquake, and all 2.2 million Israelite people standing at the foot of the mountain heard the voice of God in Exodus chapter 19 when God said, I'm the Lord, and here are the commands I have for you, and he gave them audibly the Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself of any graven image. Um, you honor your father and your mother. Do not forget the Sabbath day. You shall not steal, commit adultery, lie, bear false witness, envy, uh, or be jealous of your neighbor. He gave them all the Ten Commandments audibly. When did that happen? Fifty days after Passover. Now, did they create the Feast of Pentecost? Or the Feast of Harvest because they had a harvest? No. Remember, they're eating manna. And they're walking through the desert. For 40 years, the children of Israel celebrated the Feast of Pentecost without harvests. Because they ate manna in the desert. What were they celebrating 50 days after Passover? They're celebrating the voice of God that gave them the law. Listen, listen, listen. See the, see, the, see, the, see the connection here. 
an audible voice of God speaking to them in a language they understood so that they'd be empowered to show the world who God is in the obedience to the law. You guys with me today? It's no wonder that at the day of Pentecost, the believers are filled with the Holy Spirit and the same God that redeemed the Old Testament believers redeemed New Testament believers by the death of his son. And 50 days later, he empowered them. He empowered them to display the gospel to the whole world. How many of you can, can say to yourself, well, show me that in the scripture. Where's your proof? Listen to Romans chapter 8 with me. Listen carefully to this, what Paul says. I think Paul caught the picture here. Paul says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Ha, did you catch it? The the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. There's, There's something that God intended to do 50 days later. And Jesus intended it, God intended it, and the disciples obeyed, and thus they received what God had for them. In the Old Covenant, Passover was for Israel to be redeemed, and Sinai was for them to display the will of God to the nations by obedience to the law. In the New Testament, the cross is for your redemption, and Pentecost is empowerment for you to be a witness to display the gospel to the world. What is the purpose of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Is that you will be a witness. What did Jesus say in Romans chapter 1, or in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? In Acts 1, 8, he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say you'll do witnessing. He said you'll be. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to be what I'm supposed to be. I need to be a godly husband because I'm leading my family. I need to be a godly father because I want to be a great witness to my kids and I want them to serve Jesus Christ. I need to be a godly community member so that people see Jesus in me. I want to be a person of integrity. I want to not only speak the gospel, I want to live the gospel and I want to be a person of integrity. I want people to see Jesus in my life. And I need the power of the Holy Spirit, not just to do witnessing, but to be a witness. Is everybody with me today? I want you to hear this. It's not about doing witnessing. It's about being a witness. You will be my witnesses. And God wants to empower you to be something. And if you'll be something, you'll do what the being is supposed to do. If you'll be what God wants you to be in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll do the thing that the being is supposed to do. But I've got to be what he wants me to be. Is everybody with me today? And for me to be all that he wants me to be, I need empowerment from his Holy Spirit. Lastly, we see that the disciples received this empowerment at Pentecost. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. We're going to do it quickly because then I want us to pray together. Acts chapter 2 says this. When the day of Pentecost came, it's 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Listen to me, church. Were the 12 apostles filled? Yeah. And all the rest of the 120. All the disciples, all the followers of Jesus, all the believers that waited for that empowerment received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is not some gift that's just for the apostles. This is not something that's just for an old ancient period of church history. This is available to us today, and it is available to you. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to get hungry for God's empowerment for you to be the witness that God is making you to be. These previously fearful hiding Christians locked in an upper room who had been commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel to the whole world are empowered on the day of Pentecost. The initial evidence was two things. Well, three. There was a sound of a blowing wind. We never see that again in scripture. There were tongues of fire, whatever those look like. They came to rest on each one of them. And then they began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. And we see that repeatedly in the rest of the book of Acts, that there is evidence that follows the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in believers' lives. 
And so there's this initial evidence, but then there's an ongoing evidence that goes on throughout the day. These believers are now empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're proclaiming the goodness of God to people, and people are coming to know Jesus by the thousands. 3,000 people came to Christ that day. They were baptized in water, and Peter promised them that if you repent, if you turn to Jesus, you're baptized in his name, you too will receive the Holy Spirit. This gift, Peter promised them, this gift is for you, it's for your sons and your daughters, it's for all that the Lord our God will call, and to the people who are far off all over the world, it's for people all over, it's for people after you, your sons and daughters, and it's for everybody the Lord calls. Aren't you glad you're called to be a believer? How many of you are called to be saved? God worked in my life. He called me. And I said, yes, Jesus. I said, yes, to God's forgiveness. I said, yes, to his gospel. I said, yes, to his purpose for my life. I said, yes, to him when he called me to be saved. And Peter says that this gift is for all whom the Lord our God will call. Some of you are like, well, no, no, no. The baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is only for a few special people. That's not what Peter said. That's just not what he said. And maybe you've prayed for a while, and it takes a while to wait on the Lord, and maybe you haven't received as quickly as you'd like to receive. Listen, that does not mean that it is not for you. And let me just give you a comparison. Some of you, you've prayed for healing, and you haven't experienced the miracle of healing that you're trusting God for. Does that mean that healing is not for you ever? No, that's not what that means. Some of you, you've struggled to read your Bible and you've struggled to memorize some scriptures and you wish you were maybe a little bit more learned in God's word. Well, if you haven't accomplished it yet, does that mean it's not God's will for you to know God's word? No, no that's not what that means. It just means you're not there yet. Listen, you, you need to determine what you believe and let what you believe determine what you'll receive. Determine what you believe, and then you'll know what you should receive. And you'll keep asking God, and you'll keep waiting on God, and you'll still be filled with joy even while you're waiting. Because you know he's going to do this. He's going to do this. Your expectation determines your destination. And if you don't expect that God will empower you, if you don't expect that he's going to fill you, then can I tell you something? You'll receive what you believe. What did Jesus say to people that came to him for miracles? Be it unto you according to your faith. You'll receive what you believe. Is everybody with me today? I, won't, I, hope, that, I hope that that inside of you right now, like something's rising up to believe God for more. That God wants you to experience the Holy Spirit in this room today. Amen? And so there's, there's an initial evidence and there's an ongoing evidence. I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front, and we're going to conclude here. Now, what I've showed you is the way Jesus discipled his disciples, right? That's how Jesus discipled his disciples. Now, listen, listen, listen. Everybody still with me? Watch this. In Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans received the gospel. And the Bible says... There were miracles, signs and wonders. There were exorcisms where people were experiencing demons being cast out of unbelievers. There was deep conviction. People felt sorry for their sins and they were convicted of their sin. There was repentance and people were being baptized in water. All those things were happening in Samaria. But watch this. None of those things were the evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Several days later, the thousands of Christians in Jerusalem sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when Peter and John arrived in Samaria, they went to those believers who had experienced signs, wonders, miracles, deep conviction, baptism in water, exorcisms. They, those are some tangible things, right? And they laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And a sorcerer named Simon, who liked magic and the occult, saw that the Holy Spirit was given, and there was some evidence, there was something amazing happening when Peter and John laid their hands on these believers. And so he said, 
give me that power so that I can give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. See, he was looking the wrong way. But here's what I want you to catch. So, what did Simon see? He'd already seen miracles. He'd already seen signs. He'd already seen wonders. He'd already seen exorcisms. He'd already seen water baptism. He'd already seen deep conviction. He saw the initial evidence of people being filled with the Holy Spirit, didn't he? And he was hungry for it, even though he was lost. Come on, somebody. See how the disciples discipled others the way they were discipled. If you look in your outline this morning, you'll see a description of Peter in Acts chapter 10. There's another example. Peter discipled people with an expectation of how he was discipled. Paul, when he was saved on the road to Damascus, he was discipled by Ananias three days after he chose Christ and was saved and the Spirit came to live in him. Three days later, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Another example is in Acts chapter 19 where Paul ministers with an expectation that disciples would receive the Holy Spirit, an empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Listen, I'm telling you, this is how Jesus discipled his disciples and therefore it's how his disciples discipled others. And I don't think there's any reason for us to do any other than disciple just like that. You've received Christ as your Savior. Now today, he wants to empower you with his Holy Spirit. I'll go back to that story I started with at the beginning. My friend, he needed a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit that day, didn't he? He just needed a fresh move of God. He needed power to be a witness in a very particular time in his life when he was kind of struggling with some things. And he needed to be a witness to his wife and to his brand new baby daughter, who I'm happy to say has grown up to be an amazing Christian. <laughs> he needed that power in his new job to be a witness in his new career as a young man. And it's exciting to think all that God was doing. And then that empowerment also just helped him through a really tough time. This empowerment just helped him through a tough time. But it helped him to be a witness. Is everybody with me today? And God's called you to be something. Let's stand to our feet today and we're going to pray. If you're in the room today and you say, hey, Pastor Paul, I want to know Jesus as my Savior. In the first service, a man chose Jesus as his Savior. I was so excited to be able to pray with him. Say, today I want to choose Jesus as my Savior. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven. If that's you, hold your hand up and look at me.